So Jesus, once again, we are coming to you because we know that you are the king of the world. We know that you are the king and the creator of the entire universe. We know that you are the son of God who died on the cross for us. And what we want to do today as we study your words, we want to have ourselves be open to the challenge that you're going to be giving us. God, you're going you're gonna to reach deep into our heart and you're going to expose some things. And I pray that you would do so in a way with grace and mercy. Because what we need is for you to expose where we truly are with you so that we know where to go. Heavenly Father, we, we come from all different walks of faith. Some of us in this room have great faith. We've had an incredible summer. We are ready to serve you and we are ready to go wherever you want to go. Others of us, we've had a difficult year. We've had a difficult time and we're not sure where we're going to And yet there are others still in this room who have no idea who you are. Because our, our hearts and our minds and our spirits are closed. So I pray that you would open hearts and minds. Holy Spirit, it is only you that can open through the preaching of your word, through the gospel. And I pray that that would happen this morning. I pray for all of us that we would at least have the focus to be able to read the words on the page and have you speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, I uh, want to share with you uh, a little bit of what it was like to be a part of my youth group. So when I was your age, okay, actually when I was younger than you guys, when I was in kids too age, okay, um, our youth group was the coolest place ever. Me and my brother, who's actually here right now, he can verify this story for you. Thank you. Um, him and me, uh, we idolized everybody in our youth group, right, at church. So when we were in elementary school, we could not wait to get into youth group because we thought the youth group people were the most awesome. Okay? And um, every retreat that we would go to, every summer retreat that we would go to, um, we would have so much fun. Okay? And we did so many different things because our retreats were always so long. Okay. Uh, our church, when we went on retreats, it was from Monday through Friday. It would just be an all week. Okay. And um, we had goals in mind. We had things that we wanted to achieve every time we went to a retreat, right? And um, that's why this series, in fact, is called Resolve. Because Resolve means setting your mind and heart on something and then chasing after it with all the determination and, and focus that you have. So when you're resolved to do something, it means you will do everything in your power to make that happen. And so just on a spiritual level, the way that our retreats went were Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday nights, we would do whatever we wanted, be cool, like we don't want to worship, we don't want to worship. But on Thursday, right, the last side of the retreat, I mean, we would tell each other that we were going to cry, we would say to each other, oh man, tonight I'm ready to cry. I'm ready for God to wreck me. I'm ready for Him to mess me up. Like, what would happen on Thursday night? Hands would shoot up out of nowhere. Tears would fly out of people's eyes, and, and other liquids would fly out of people's eyes. Right? People would be on the ground, just bowing down, and just like, Ugh, right? And people would be like, oh, God, I want to be saved again. This is my seventh time. I want to be saved again, God. I want to give you my life, right? And we would pray prayers like, God, forgive me for my sins on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But I give you my life now, and we come up, and we have these open minds, and we declare how much God has changed us, and how we're never going to sin again. We say, amen, we're never going to sin again, right? And then Thursday night, after the lemon's done, we would sin like crazy. Um, <laughs> but that's just how the pattern was, right? So we had this attitude and this resolve that certain things were going to happen, and then, and then it would happen. But I want to take the story of this one person. Okay, we called him, actually, uh, his name was Kevin, too. I forget his last name, okay? But we called him <laughs> Kevin Young, okay? And this guy was much older than us. So when I was in um, kids two, uh, like like fourth, fifth, sixth, fourth, fifth grade, he was in uh, a senior or a junior in high school. Okay, and he was like to us, like he was like super old because he had facial hair. Right? Uh, there aren't that many Asian eighteen-year-olds who have facial hair. It's pretty rare. Okay, um, and so this guy was just like super old and super short. Anyway, he was crazy. When it came to the other thing that our youth group was known for, which was pranking people. Okay? Uh, our church, when it came to summer retreats, I mean, sometimes the reasons why certain people would go is to be to to to, to prank people, and then there would be other people who would never go to retreats because they never want to be pranked on. Okay? It's one of the reasons why in our church the culture is there's no prank. And if you prank at somebody else and you do something to someone else's property or you do something to something, someone else's stuff, like, you are kicked out. Like, I don't want that kind of environment. Because I grew up in that kind of environment. Okay? 
Um, and now I will say, there's moments where it's fun, but there's also moments where it's terrifying. Because every time a new class of 6th graders would come into the youth group, because our youth group at the time was 6th grade to 12th grade, the 6th graders knew what was going to happen. The upperclassmen, the high schoolers, were going to destroy them and prank them. So can you imagine, Monday, all the 6th graders and 7th graders, they just stay up. Right? They just like, like, it's like, there's a war outside, and uh, everyone's at the door, and they're coming, and they're coming, and it would be like that until 6 o'clock in the morning, like, all right, I'm going to take a nap for 30 minutes, you watch the door, right? And we sleep, right? But you can't do that for an entire week, so what happened on Wednesday, eventually, but are they coming? Right? And then what would happen? The guys would break in, and we wake up, and they jump all over our face, right? I mean, at, at some point, you feel sorry for the 6th and 7th graders, because it's like, it's like a horror movie, where if they fall asleep, they'll die. Right? So they're just like, sitting back, I don't want to go to sleep, man. I don't want to go to sleep, man. Uh, and then they wake up in the morning, and there's stuff all over, right? right? Uh, and, and that was just the, the color of the way that our, that our youth group worked. And there's this one guy, Kevin Young. He was the master. He was the ninja, okay? He was the guy that everyone looked up to in terms of the pranks that he would do, right? And he would do uh, draw, like he would have artwork, like tattoos on people's faces without them waking up. He was the master at drawing on your face with a marker without you waking up, right? People have been on the bus with him, awake with him, having a conversation, and when they got off the bus, they're like, dude, when did you draw this on my marker? Like, how did you do that, right? Um, he was just the master at that. There was, and he, and he got better and better as, as he got older. So ninth grade was certain things, tenth grade was certain things. Well, there was one year where he actually sewed, okay? Sewed, right? The guys to their sleeping bag. So when they woke up in the morning, they were stuck to their sleeping bag. Like, we had guys in the, in the bunk beds, and back then, whatever reason, they didn't have guards. Like, guys would just fall out of the bunk bed, trying to get their sleeping bag. They couldn't. They're like, what's going on, right? And so we had heard these stories. Okay? Now, the year before I got into YouTube, um, we had heard this incredible story about how this guy, this, this Kevin Young character, had so much resolve that even through all of the, 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 the blockades that were put in front of him, he got through. So one year, the pastor was just like, you know what, I'm sick and tired of it. No more pranking this year, nothing. I'm going to search through everyone's bags. So we had a mandatory bag search. Before you put the bag on the bus, the guy teachers would go through the guy's bags. The girl teachers would go through the girl's bag. And anything that could be used as a pranking thing was, was, was thrown out. Like, deodorant, you could rub this on someone's face. Out. Right? Like, it was just, hey, lipstick, why do you need lipstick? Out. Right? And we would just go through and then, like, like, people found markers. One guy even brought a pocket knife. No, no, no. So not a pocket knife. Like a machete hunting knife. Right? And it's, why are you breaking this? Like, I don't know what to expect, but I think Michael, I totally remember. He was like, I was just wanting to be prepared. Like, what was going to happen? Like a bear was going to come? <laughs> no, he took the knife away. Anyways, all this stuff, and, and, and even Kevin had nothing, like there was a few markers in there, and they took it all out, and then everyone rode the bus, and everyone was like, in, and the sixth year and seventh year were all like, Oh, this year, this will be no prank, we can relax, okay? But well, what happened was, slowly, like Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, like, like little things started happening. Like someone had like one mark on their face. Like, where did it come from? I thought we took all the markers away. Like, ah, it's not a big deal. But, but Kevin, this guy had prepared this whole plan. His, his thing was, as a senior, this was going to be his last retreat, he wanted to do something that would be remembered forever. So his plan was to go into the girls' rooms and to sew them to their sleeping room. Okay. Now that's terrible because first of all, like a guy coming into the girls' room in the middle of the night, like, this is all bad news. Like all bad news. And the camp that we were at, that we had rented at the time, there was like one giant building that we were in, and the girls were all on one side, and the guys were all on the other side. Which means that the rooms were all back to back to each other, and the only thing they were sharing was one wall. But all of the doors had locks on them. Like this was a really really nice campsite where there were the key, it was almost like a hotel, and you couldn't get into the rooms. And so he was trying to figure out, and this is a place that we go to all the time. He had been scheming for the last two years on how he was going to <laughs> And somehow, okay, somehow, he uh, figured out that um, you can get into the girls' rooms from the inside. Okay, so what he did was, in the middle of the night, this was like on Wednesday, when, when everyone thought that they were safe, um, in his room there was an air conditioned bed. And it wasn't one of those small beds, because it was a giant room, it was one of those square beds. Okay. Oh so he had somehow brought a screwdriver, so he had a screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> like a Mission Impossible thing. Right? <laughs> he crawled down the side. Now here's the thing, and this is, to this day, we still have no idea how this happened. The vents are screwed on the outside. So if he can unscrew it from the guy's side, even if he crawls through the vent, how is he going to unscrew it on the girl's side? So we still don't know to this day how that happened. Because in movies, what happens? Usually people kick the vent open. 
right? But you can't kick a vent open, everyone will wake up. Somehow, he magically ninja something, right? Or used like a, I don't know, lasers maybe? <laughs> but he got it open, he went into the girls' room, and he sewed a few of the girls to their sleeping bags. And then he walked out the front door. <laughs> opened the door and walked out the front door. Nobody knew who did it. It only turned out after, but everybody at the retreat got punished, it was like this huge deal. The girls were like, I don't feel safe anymore. <laughs> because what he did was he, he would tie their, he would sew their sleeves all the way up the shoulder. Can you imagine a guy sitting there behind you? <laughs> and so, so, so the guys like, they got into so much trouble because they were like, we know you, the guys were like, we know you did. The girls, the guys were like, we know, no, no, it's did it. And Yeah. <laughs> and the guys started blaming the girls. They're like, why are you blaming us? It was the girls' room. You should blame the girls. I remember the girls got in trouble with Luke the Purple. And on the bus on the way down, he was like, <laughs> he was a senior and no one was going to do anything about it, right? Anyway, so, uh, suffice to say, um, his resolve led to lots of people trying to top him but never top him. Okay, now, what resolve means is that you will do anything in your power to get the thing done. Okay? And here's the, here's the idea. We sometimes think of resolve as something that's like, just like a hardcore feeling towards something, and it's only something that happens on a really high level, but it's not. See, all of us, every single, every single one of us in this room, we have things that we resolve to do. And sometimes it comes out in short spurts. Like, if you guys play competitive sports, even if you don't care really what the output of the game is, if someone on the other team is talking trash at that moment, you resolve to destroy them in the game, right? That's just your heart, that's just your attitude, it's where we go. Now, what I want to do is I want to say this. At the beginning of the year, right, most of you guys have already started school. Actually, who did start school yet? What? <laughs> Amazing. Okay, that's great. So if you haven't started school yet, you will this week, right? And so the idea is that you are this year preparing to resolve yourself to do something with this year. And some of you may not have even thought about that, but you had things in mind. So when you got to school on that first day, or when you're going to go to school on the first day, you have goals in mind. You have things you want to accomplish. Here's what I want to do. I want to break down for you guys this morning okay, what it truly means to follow Jesus. That's what we're aiming for. So over the next couple weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about. And what I want to do today is I want to show you guys what it means to be resolved to follow Jesus. So turn with me to Luke chapter 9. Okay, so turn with me to Luke chapter 9. And uh, we're actually going to skip through parts of Luke chapter 9. So you through different verses. So just um, stick with us, pay attention, and we'll walk through this. Our focus really is going to be on 51 through 62, but I just want to read through some of this stuff so we have an idea of this particular chapter. Okay. So Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, no bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whatever, wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everyone. So right now, right at the beginning of chapter 9, we're introduced to this story where the disciples have been sent out by Jesus. So Jesus has given them the authority to, to, to heal, cast out demons, to preach His word on His behalf. They're going out and they're doing it. It's actually happening. In different places the disciples are going, uh, they're healing people, uh, demons are leaving, and they are ministering to the countryside. Okay? Uh, skip down to verse 10. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day had begun to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in this but he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so, and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. 
Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Now what happens is, uh, we all know this story, we all know this miracle, but I want you to understand that the disciples are coming back from doing Jesus' ministry, right? And they come back and they're all hyped up and they're all excited. And then they have this uh, 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 dilemma that's in front of them because there's these 5,000 men, which actually means that there were more women and children. So there were probably about 20,000 people that had come to hear Jesus speak. There's these 20,000 people who Jesus just told, I want you to feed them. And they're like, we, we can't. We have five loaves, we have two fish. We can't. There's no way in the world that we can possibly feed them. So what Jesus does is he prays over the food, and then it begins to multiply and multiply and multiply until everyone is satisfied. And the idea is that right now what Luke is showing us is that the disciples are getting more and more a vision of who Jesus is. So it starts off with, he's given us this power, and now we've seen him multiply food and feed the multitude. Okay? Look at verse 18. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others, that one of the prophets of old is risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Right? So they're getting an idea of who Jesus is, and they're realizing Jesus is the Messiah. Now, in the disciples' heads, the Messiah was the person who was going to be the greater David. Right? So King David was a king in the Old Testament who led the, um, the kingdom of Israel into a lot of prosperity. He was their best king. He led them in the greatest victories in battle. He expanded the country. Right? He did what a good king should do. And so that when they hear Peter say that Christ is, is the Christ of God, they hear the Messiah of God. They hear the new and the better and the greater David. So they're thinking right now, this is amazing. Right? Jesus is going to come and he's going to raise up an army and he's going to go to Rome and he's going to take down Caesar and he's going to make Israel its own country again. Because right now that was their struggle. The Israelites were under the regime of the Romans. Verse 21, Jesus wants to correct this. He says, he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and on the third day be raised. But Jesus wants to correct them and say, Look, when you say that I'm the Messiah, I know what you're thinking, but don't think that. My mission is not to go and overthrow Rome. My mission is to go and overthrow sin. I'm going to die and on the third day be raised again. And look at what he says in verse 23. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save him. And so then what Jesus says is he lays out, Look, if you want to follow me, if you want to be a part of the movement that I'm a part of, if you want to be my follower, if you want to be a Christian, this is what it's going to cost you. Verse 24, Whoever would lose his life, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save him. <clears throat> and so I want to go ahead and move forward to verse 51. Fast forward to verse 51. And Jesus now is going to leave the countryside, cut through right, a region called Samaria, and he's going to head towards Jerusalem. And this is what Luke says about that. Verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So the first thing that you have to understand about resolve is that Jesus had this resolve that he was going to go to Jerusalem. Now what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem? He's going to be betrayed by his disciples. He's going to be taken in by the chief priests and scribes and he's going to be falsely accused. He's going to be beaten. He's going to die. And he's going to be put on a cross and he's going to be crucified. And he knows that this is where he's going to go. But what does it say? It says that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus did not shrink back from his responsibility <coughs> and the task and the mission that he had to go and die. And we know later on that before the night before Jesus is crucified, he goes to the garden to pray. And he prays with such agony and he prays with such stress that he begins to sweat blood. See, this isn't something necessarily that Jesus wants to do. In the sense that he uh, is, is, is just going to go because it's something that he has to do. This is something he does not want to do because he does not want to be separated from God. He does not want to receive this pain. But because he knows it's God's will, he will do so in obedience. And all of that is wrapped up in the verse 51. That 
that when Jesus knew the time was to come, he was going to head towards Jerusalem. Nothing was going to stop. Verse 52. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. So, um, we have here this idea that the Samaritans rejected Jesus and did not, allow, did not allow him and his followers to stay in the town. Now, historically, the Samaritans and the Jewish people, they had issues with each other, right? There were racial tensions between the two groups. That's most likely why they didn't allow them to stay. So the Samaritans, it's not because of Jesus, but it's because they were a bunch of Jewish guys. They're like, we don't want you to stay with us. You can't stay in our hotels. You can't stay in our inns. Just go along, go along. And they keep getting rejected, rejected, rejected. So by the time they come to the end of the town, two of his disciples are really unknown. Verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Okay. Now, they've seen Jesus do amazing things. Okay. These are men that have seen Jesus feed the 5,000. Uh, we fixed the, we skipped the transfiguration part. But earlier in this chapter, James and John were witnesses to Jesus' glory. They saw a, G, a glimpse of Jesus' glory. And I think what's happening here is James and John are like, you know what? This guy is the Messiah. He's the one that's going to come in. He's going to get rid of Rome. And everyone that's rude to us, they're going to get what's coming to them. And so they turn around to Jesus and they say, you know what, God? I mean, you know what, Jesus? Do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume this entire town that's rejected us? Uh, and it's funny because they say it almost as if they expect Jesus to be like, yes, yes I do. Let's burn this to the ground right now. <laughs> right? And they're going to be yeah, they're going to give each other high fives, and then they're going to do this, and the fire's going to flame. As if that's actually going to happen. It's almost like these guys haven't been paying attention. Here's the thing. They got excited about Jesus, but for all the wrong reasons. They got excited about Jesus, but for all the wrong reasons. See, they thought they could take <laughs> Jesus and make him their own in the sense that they thought they could take all the power of Jesus, all the different things that Jesus stands for, and make it their own so that they can use Jesus' power so that they can feel better about themselves. That's what they thought they were doing. But what happens in verse 15 and 5? But he turned and rebuked them. Simple. Jesus said, no, that's not how it's going to work. If you have another version of the Bible, there are some versions of the Bible where it adds when Jesus says to them, the Son of Man did not come to destroy lives, but to save them. You know, the NIV can be a version of the NASB. It adds that verse. The reason why the ESV doesn't have that at the end of verse 55 is because um, the oldest manuscripts don't have those verses. Or it doesn't have that line. But it doesn't matter whether or not your Bible has it or doesn't have it. I would imagine that's exactly what Jesus would say. We're going to show mercy to these people. My job in going to Jerusalem is not to go and kill everybody. My job in going to Jerusalem is to be killed for them. It's totally different. And it says in verse 56, and they went on to another day. Now, at this point, um, the story is going to shift a little bit. We're going to be introduced to three people. And these three people, they are three different kinds of people who want to follow Jesus. These are three different kinds of people who want to follow Jesus. And I want you to pay attention to how Jesus talks to them, because this is crucial for you and I in understanding how we're going to follow Jesus. Look at verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Okay. So Jesus and his disciples are walking along the road. They've just left Samaria. And then a guy comes, and he's waving after them, and he's saying, Jesus, Jesus, hold on, hold on, hold on. I will follow you wherever you go. Let me go with you. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Okay. Now Jesus has this incredible ability to read people's hearts. Because he's the Son of God. He's got this. And so Jesus rarely, in the Gospels, when you see somebody asking the question, does he rarely answer the question? He has a tendency to answer the question behind the question. Because he can see into people's heart. And so what he does is he addresses inside this man's heart an issue. Look at what it says. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So this man is coming after Jesus and saying, Jesus, wherever you go, I will follow you. Wherever you go, I'll follow you. And Jesus says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What that means is, in creation, it is natural for everyone to have a home, for all of creation to have a home. Everyone has some place where they go to, to sleep, to rest, and to resuscitate themselves. But for me, for Jesus, I don't have that place because this is not my home. And what he's telling this man that's wanting to follow Jesus is, if you want to follow me, 
then you have to make sure that you forsake this earth. And you have to make sure that you are willing to be uncomfortable for the rest of your life. Because this earth, this world, is not your home. Are you willing to live with it? Are you willing to trade in this world for my kingdom? That's what Jesus is asking. Jesus is asking you, are you willing to trade in your comfort so that you can live uncomfortably for the rest of your life for Jesus? That's what the challenge of what Jesus is saying. And so this guy that wants to follow Jesus, remember, he wants to follow him. That's what he says, right? If you were Jesus and you were trying to have this movement of disciples to follow you, to, to, to live for you and spread your gospel after you die, don't you want to collect people who want to be with you? But the thing is, Jesus makes it really hard to follow. Because Jesus, because following Jesus means not following on your terms, following on his terms. You see, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, then you do what I tell you to do. Are you willing to live with this? And this is lesson number one. Lesson number one is if you follow me, then you need to forsake this world. This world needs to no longer be your home. Your home needs to be heaven. Your home needs to be my kingdom. And then another person, right? Verse 59. To another, he said, follow me. Now, this one's interesting, right? Because now the situation is reversed. Jesus is walking along, and he sees somebody, and he tells that person, I want you to follow me. Verse 59, but he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, what does Jesus mean here? Because it sounds like something that's kind of mean, it's kind of short. But the idea is that, um, the man that is taught, the man that is being called to follow Jesus, his father is not actually dead. Yet. When he says, "Let me go and bury my father," what he's saying is, "My father is um, still alive, but he's really old. He's about to die, and so I need to clean up the family's finances. My father is going to leave behind a, an inheritance for me, and so I need to make sure that all of those things happen that I'm taken care of, that all of my financial situation is taken care of, and then I'll come and follow." And this is basically an excuse. And what does Jesus say to the excuse? He says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. And by the way, the original language in the Aramaic, this is actually a pun. And it's, it's, uh, a, a better way of understanding it is leave the spiritually dead to bury the physically dead. That's what Jesus means. Leave the spiritually dead to bury the physical dead. So the physical things of this world, the material things of this world, all of that, if you care more about those things than you do about the spiritual realities, then just, you know what? You're spiritually dead and you go and care for the things that are physically dead. Um, and this one I think is most real to us because for those of us that live in America, this is just how we orient our lives. <clears throat> we are busy, we have things to do, there are things to occupy our time, and a lot of this stuff is good stuff. What's interesting is Jesus doesn't rebuke him. In the sense where he says, don't do that, that's a bad thing. Right? Because taking care of the family's finances, making sure all of that's tipped up, you know, ready to go, that's a good thing. But, but what Jesus is telling this man is that you care, about more, you care more about those things than you do about following. And this is actually in contrast to um, the disciple Matthew. So when the apostle Matthew, when he was called, he was sitting at um, the, the tax collector's table. Jesus looked at him and said, follow me. And Matthew said, okay, push the table aside, just got to start following me. And so, this man, this man that's making an excuse, he's not willing to do that. And honestly, that's like so much of us. We make excuses based on the things that are in front of us, as opposed to looking beyond those things and looking at, how can I follow Christ? Don't raise your hands. Just think about this for a second. How many of you guys read your Bibles, prayed, spent some personal time with God this week? Think about that for a second. Maybe once, maybe twice, maybe not at all. And I want you to think through, why didn't you do that? You know it's important, right? Most of you guys have been in church long enough to know reading the Bible, praying regularly, spending time with God is important for your spiritual life, it's important for your faith. You know this. It's not like this is new information. But the reason why we don't do that is because we make excuses. Right? We justify it. We go, God, look, look, look I'm in school until 3 o'clock. 2 o'clock, 3.30, I'm going to eat my snack that my mom prepares for me. All of you guys eat after school, I know you do. 3.30 to 
four o'clock, I have to take a shower and get ready for, I don't know, whatever activity, soccer, football, ballet, basketball, guitar lessons, violin lessons, piano lessons, flute lessons, viola, cello, ukulele, harp. <laughs> Let's do it one time ago, we used to play the harp. And you have lesson, right? And then at 5.30, you have to come home, you have to wash up, you have to do homework, and then you have dinner at 7.30, and by 9.30, that's your time. You know, you just say, God, I can't prioritize you in my life. So forget it, you're just out. And then Monday to Friday, you know, that schedule stays the same, and because you didn't do that Monday to Friday, on Saturday, you have more time, but what do we do? Well, I didn't do it Monday to Friday, I feel a little guilty, so I'm just going to do it today. That'll be my direction. And we justify all of those decisions, and we make excuses for all those things. Now, I'm not saying lessons are bad, sports are bad. I'm not saying any of those things are bad. But when all of those things begin to be prioritized on top of Christ, then it becomes a losing proposition. So, do you guys need to think about this? Because this is the one that I think sticks at the Americans more. This is the one that sticks at us the most. Because this is our culture. This is where we live. We make excuses, we justify them, and we say, this is a good thing. Jesus should understand. This is important to me. If, he's really, if he really cares for me, then he should understand that this is important. And what does Jesus say? Leave the physically, the spiritually dead to bury their own physically dead. If you think the physical things are more important than the spiritual things, you are spiritually dead. Jesus allows you to go and take care of the physically dead. So he says, go. If you think that that stuff is more important than me, then you are free to go and make those things more important. But then he gives another chance, and what he's saying, but as for you, <coughs> he's saying, don't do this. Go and proclaim the kingdom. And this is going to be important for us in the long run, and we'll come back to this in the, in the next couple of weeks. But the idea is that how do you fight against these kinds of excuses? How do you and I as Americans, how do you and I as people who are busy with our schedules in our life, fight against our excuses and begin to make space for us to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's going to be so crucial for us in the year to come. And you're going to see how that's going to eliminate a lot of our excuses. Because it's going to build an urgency in us. Right? Christ is so wise in here to throw that in. It's a small thing. But it, it's going to come out and we're going to do this in ways that I think you're going to get excited. Because basically what it comes down to is this. You prioritize what's important. You always prioritize what's important. For the most part. But what happens is, if you know that there's a deadline, or you know that there's something that has to be done, otherwise something that has to, be to happen, you will prioritize those things. That's why your teachers give you projects a month in advance, because they know you're only going to spend the last two days before the project is due working. Okay? They know that. But they give it to you a month in advance, so that you would have time to procrastinate, and then when it's time for you to finish, you will finish on time. And the same thing goes for the kingdom of God. See, the reason why a lot of you guys have no spiritual urgency, the reason why a lot of you guys have no personal quiet time with God and you don't cultivate that relationship because there's no spiritual urgency. Spiritual urgency comes when you recognize and realize that the kingdom of God is real and that the kingdom of God needs to be proclaimed. So for those of you who have never, ever evangelized to anybody, your faith is personal, your faith is your own, and you've never evangelized to anybody, I guarantee this is what you struggle with. You make excuses for your faith all the time. But for those of you who have been up there, who have evangelized your friends, who have gone on the various mission trips that we've had at our church, you know exactly the kind of urgency that I'm talking about. And when you're out there and you're proclaiming the gospel and you're evangelizing and you're witnessing and you're sharing your faith with your friends, all of a sudden, doing quiet time, studying the Bible, going to church, making God a priority, that becomes way, way more important. Because you recognize the spiritual kingdom and you recognize the spiritual reality that's behind your ability to share the gospel and share the faith. So that's another big thing for us as we move forward in this year. That there's going to be tons of opportunities for us to go out, to share, and go and complain. Because I'm tired of the excuses, and I know deep down inside you are too. You are tired of the excuses, and you want to be shaken out of your faith, and you want to do something, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take Christ's advice. And then the last person, verse 61. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And again, it comes back around to, what is Christ worth to you? Is he worth more than even the most important in your family, even the most important people in your family? Is he worth more than all? 
And that's going to be crucial for us, and that's going to be important for us as we move forward and think about what does it mean to truly follow Jesus. And I will say this, okay? This is a hard challenge. This entire paragraph is a difficult, difficult passage for even Christians to read, because nobody's going to read this and be like, oh, you know what? I'm good with this, because I've done this already. I'm doing everything that I possibly can for Christ. Every Christian on earth right, is going to read this and be challenged by this. And we're going to be like, oh, there's more that I can give to Christ. It's very true. But the question is, how do we take this and begin our first steps towards giving more of our life to Christ? It comes down to trust. The faith that you have in Christ is going to be coming out in the way that you give your life to I want to share with you a quote from uh, Kevin DeYoung. This is what he says. Trusting in God's provision does not mean we expect to float to heaven on flowery beds of ease. This is a sad world we live in, one in which God not only allows trouble, but at times <coughs> sends adversity to us. Trust, therefore, does not mean hoping for the absence of pain, but believing in the purpose of pain. And the reason why I want to point this quote out in particular is because a lot of us the reason why we have yet to follow after Christ with everything that we have is because we don't trust in Him. There have been hurts in our lives. There have been things that have happened to us that we're just not sure. And we're just not 100% convinced that, that Jesus is worth serving. <coughs> but I'm telling you right now, who else in the entire universe can we say this for? Right? Who else can you say, trust therefore does not mean hoping for the absence of pain, but believing in the purpose of it? Who else can we say that of? Jesus is the only one. In fact, I want to make this point really clear. Only Jesus can ask you to give up your life to follow His because He gave up His life for you. Jesus is the only person on earth that can ask you to do this and be right for doing that because He gave His life for you. If your best friend, I don't know who your best friend is, I don't know how long you've known them, but if your best friend, who you've known for many, many years, and you sleep over their house, they sleep over your house, you guys even share the same, like you're willing to drink from the same cup they were willing to drink from, gross, but for your best friend, you would do it. It's not fun, right? So, let's say you have your best friend. Your best friend sits you down one night, and it's like, oh my gosh, I have something to tell you. But in order for me to, to really tell you, you have to trust me, you have to follow me with your entire life. If you give up your life for my life, are you willing to do that with me? You're going to look at them and you're going to be like, I think you have an issue. <laughs> I love you as a friend, but I'm going to go home. I'm going to away from the house, and you're going to call your mom, and you're going to go home. <coughs> Only Jesus can require this of us because Jesus himself gave his life. But here's the thing. You have to love Jesus in order to do it. Okay? So imagine that you had five dollars, okay? and I had a quarter. And I said, I will trade you with this quarter. For your five dollars. Right? And I'll say in the sneakiest salesperson voice that I can. What would you say? Thanks, sure, but no thanks. Now what if I told you, wait, 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 wait. But this coin is not just your average quarter. This is one of those old, old, old coins that are made out of pure silver. And not only is it made out of pure silver, it's one of five special memorial coins that were created at the inauguration of President, uh, President Lincoln's inauguration. I'm just making that up. <laughs> I don't think it would work. But imagine that that happened. Okay? And then this coin, as a collector's item, is worth half a million dollars. Now would you trade in this coin for your five dollars? Of course you would. Right? Of course you would. In a heartbeat, you would snatch that quarter out of a hand and throw the five dollars and run away as fast as you can. You want to exchange the deal. Because the five dollars is nothing compared to the quarter that, that I have in my hand. See, that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, look, you want to follow me? You cannot look at me like just a 25 cent quarter. But you need to realize that I am worth more than anything that you could ever have. And whether it's fame, whether it's popularity, whether it's what school you go to, whether it's how much money you have, how big your house is, what car you drive, the clothes you wear, whether all of those things are more important than Jesus or not, Jesus is saying, none of that compares to me. And I'll show you when you give all that stuff up and you run after me. That's our calling for the year. That's our calling for the year. And what we're going to do is every week, week in and week out, you're going to sit here and you're going to learn how we do that better. The reason why I put a picture of the road for this series is because we're at the beginning of this 
basically never any road. The end of that road is your death. Okay? The end of that road is when you die. And this is the road that Jesus is asking us to go on. And basically say, come, follow me, one step at a time. For the next 51 weeks, every single Sunday, when you gather at this church, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be teaching you how to follow Jesus. This year's theme is practical theology. This year's theme is learning from God how to follow God. And we're going to break this down and we're going to do it one step. And as you guys close your eyes. Jesus, at this time we, we come and we pray that you would fill our hearts with this kind of resolve that will push us through to follow after you with all that we do, to chase after you, to run after you with the whole Father, a lot of us in this room, we don't even know yet what exactly that means. But we know that you're good enough. You are trustworthy enough. You are faithful enough. That we want to stand and say, Jesus, whatever this looks like, at least for now, I'm willing to give my life to you. I'm willing to dedicate my, my whole life to you, to give it to you, that you can do what you want to do. And I trust you and I love you and I want to follow up. And I pray, God, that as we study through the next couple weeks and really the rest of this year, what exactly that means. I pray, God, week in and week out, that you would behind us of this promise that we are making to you, and you would make yourself known. That every challenge that we come across, and everything that you are asking us to do, doesn't become a burden, but it becomes a joy. Jesus, we thank you for this time. In your name we pray. Amen.